Welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Christine Mark, the DIA's Manager of Volunteer Development. Thank you for joining our first virtual screening of the mystery of Picasso. This special event is limited to the first 200 guests. In the comments box, a link to the film and a password will be published um, so that you can sign on. This link will only be valid for the rest of today and tomorrow. To introduce the film, Community Engagement Manager Amanda Harrison Keeley is joined by film curator Elliot Wilhelm and curator of Prints and Drawings Claire Rogan. If you'd like to ask our curators a question, please select the Q&A icon on the right side of your screen and type in your question. Thank you. Well, Elliot Wilhelm has been the director of the Detroit Film Theater Series at the Detroit Institute of Arts since 1973 and has held the title of Curator of Film at the DIA since 1984. One of the most acclaimed and best attended film programs in the nation, the DFT has been visited by more than 4 million moviegoers in the last 45 years. Claire Rogan has been our curator of prints and drawings at the DIA since December of 2017. Recent exhibitions include the current show from Bruegel to Rembrandt, Dutch and Flemish prints and drawings, 1550 to 1700. An additional exhibition was uh, called From Camelot to Kent State, Pop Art, 1960 to 1975, which we held at the DIA in 2017 or 2018-19. Claire is a specialist in European and American prints and drawings, German art from 1848 to 1945, and LGBTQ art history. Please give our guests a warm welcome. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to everyone who is at home watching. We appreciate you joining us today for this completely new program experience that we're really excited to share with you. Just as a reminder, a link to the film is in the chat box. It is password protected, so please use the password Motown in order to access that film. It's available to you anytime today and tomorrow. So Pablo Picasso's art emerges in front of our eyes in this remarkable 1956 film by French master of suspense, Henry George Klaus. Elliot, what inspired you to share it with our audience and what do you love about this film? Well, first of all, those two go hand in hand and hello, Amanda. Um, this picture uh, was something that I kind of dreamed of seeing when I was considerably younger. Um, as you said, I, I got to the DFT in 1973, and in those days there was no such thing as um, a DVD or a video cassette or cable TV or internet or anything. You had to see a movie in a theater. And this movie was something that was almost impossible to find. In fact, it was impossible to find. Um, I really first heard about it because there was a film critic I admired a great deal, Pauline Kael, and my very first trip to New York, which I think was 1970, something like that, they had these things called phone books and you could actually look up people in a phone book and their telephone number was there. She was already film critic at the New Yorker and she was listed in the phone book. And I called her up out of the blue and said, I'm this kid and I write reviews for my college newspaper. And do you have any time to talk? I would love to talk to you about your writing. She said, come on over. So I went to her apartment and we began talking about films that I had read about that she had written about. And one of them that she had done a small blurb on in The New Yorker was The Mystery of Picasso. And it turns out that Pauline Kael used to do what I do now, which was to program for a so-called art house or, or movie theater that shows foreign specialized films, documentaries, and so on. And when she ran a theater in Berkeley, California, Years earlier, she had run The Mystery of Picasso and had written about it. And she was so excited by it and her writing on it is so extraordinary. She talks about the joy that the, the film produces in the viewer. 
that it became a kind of um, a holy grail for me. I really, really wanted to see it. And one of the first things I tried to do when I got the job at the Detroit Institute of Arts to program films was to find a copy of The Mystery of Picasso to show it to the audiences, but also to see it for myself. It took decades because the movie went through all kinds of terrible times in terms of copyright, uh, who owned it, who, who claimed to own it, where you could get a good copy. And it wasn't until the early 90s we showed it at the DFT. And I sat there and watched this film. And it, you know, I hate this expression, it changed my life, but it, it really did. Uh, it was a, a way of seeing creation uh, of a work of art that I had not imagined. I, I read all about it, knew how it was supposed to work, but didn't understand the effect it was going to have on me until I, I watched it. So we did program it and we had a, a fairly good sized audience, but the film itself has never attracted huge audiences um, anywhere in the world, although its reputation is certainly elevated and its critical reputation is extraordinary and it won a big prize at the Cannes Film Festival in 1956 when it was first um, debuted. But when people get to see it for themselves, I, I think whatever I've said here um, is gonna disappear and their own feelings about watching works of art being created on the screen in a unique way will come out but um, I don't want to monopolize the conversation at this point. It sounds like this is an excellent opportunity for our audiences, and I'm so glad that we can share this film with them today. It is considered to be a documentary, but as you alluded to, um, it, it said that it's, critics have said that this film is too original to be fully appreciated in its time. Will you set the stage? What is our audience seeing in these first few frames? Well, it, what, what you're going to be seeing in the film uh, is something that Picasso himself, about 20 years before this movie was made, had uh, mentioned in conversation to, to more than a few people that it would be interesting to observe the creative process and that by doing that, you might be able to understand a little bit about where um, the images came from, how they meshed, uh, what creation looks like. And early in the film, it's mentioned that a great author, there's no way to get in to the mind of a great author as the author is writing. There's no way to get into the mind of a great composer as the composer is composing music. But with painting and drawing, you can see the process as it happens and you can make connections as it happens. But how do you photograph that without just putting a camera over someone's shoulder and watching that person create art uh, in real time? And if you're gonna make a film that runs less than 90 minutes and you wanna show a lot of works of art being created and you do them all in real time, that's not gonna work. Particularly with Picasso, one of the paintings, as you'll see in the film, um, which takes Oh, just a, a couple of minutes really to be created before our eyes it actually took five hours for him to paint. And that time is compressed by speeding up the action. Um, and you do that through something called under cranking in which the camera moves at a, at a slower speed than normal. And then when you project it, you see things moving more quickly than normal. What the director of the film, Henri-Georges Clouseau and his friend Pablo Picasso finally understood they wanted to do was to turn the movie screen itself into a canvas. So how do you do that? They didn't know. A film had been made earlier in which Picasso was seen painting through a piece of glass. That was interesting, but you also saw Picasso himself as he was painting it, and it was distracting from the actual work of art being created. So what they ultimately decided to do uh, was use this, this kind of ink that Picasso had accidentally come across, which bled through a certain kind of paper, but without spreading out in ways that were, were not helpful. And what that meant was that Clouseau, the director, could put his camera on one side of the canvas, Picasso was sitting on the other drawing his art, but you didn't see the artist. You only saw the brush strokes and the colors of what it was that he was doing. You saw it in a mirror image, it was reversed because you were, you were behind it but nevertheless, you were seeing it being created. And in that way, you see the thought process. What's astounding when you first see this technique is that you'll see him 
do a curve, do a line over here, put a dot over here, and you have no idea what it's going to become. You have no idea that how these the, these things are going to be connected. He doesn't announce, and now I'm going to draw a picture of a woman asleep. You see the miracle of these little motions uh, turning into this this extraordinary work that you had not imagined, and it's it's almost like watching ideas unfold in your own head. Uh, you take it where you think it's going to go, and then you at some point let go, and you allow this work to, in a sense, create itself. And we do meet the creator. We meet Picasso a number of times during the film. One very notably um, during a, a break toward the center of the film that we can we can talk about later. Sounds like Clouseau is a very well-respected director of his time and had many different types of films. What was Clouseau best known for? Well, this is a fascinating film for him to have made, uh, particularly at this time, because uh, just a few years before this, uh, 1953 and 1955, the, the year that he began work on the mystery of Picasso, he was known as the French Hitchcock. He made thrillers. One of them, uh, which won prizes all over the world and has been remade a number of times, was called The Wages of Fear. And it's about four guys in a South American country who are desperate to get out. They're broke. And it turns out that there's a fire that's broken out in an oil refinery. And they sign up to get enough money to get out of the country by volunteering to drive two trucks filled with highly explosive nitroglycerin over really rocky, impossible to navigate mountain roads that could blow up at any second because of the volatility of the nitroglycerin. So the movie's two and a half hours long, the first hour is set up, and the last 90 minutes is their journey. And you wait, as one critic said, you sit there waiting for the screen to explode. And you, you get involved in their lives as they talk to each other, but at any moment, this could all end. And it's a fantastic suspense film. And it turns out to be a, a really nasty little metaphor about the fate of mankind in general. He was also really known for another great thriller called Diabolique, about um, uh, two women, one the mistress of a guy, the other the guy's wife, who get together and decide they're going to murder this man um, because he's been so horrible to both of them. But it's full of twists and turns. And it's a film that the real Alfred Hitchcock was extremely envious of, and he later on hired the two writers of Diabolique um, to write a film for him, which became Vertigo in 1958. But Clouseau was known as the master of suspense of France. And as you watch The Mystery of Picasso, uh, I feel this great sense of suspense through the film with every brush stroke, with every line, with every point in the canvas coming together to, to become something, that, that mystery becomes suspenseful as what it's going to be. And is he going to make it successful? And in a couple of instances, one famous one you'll see in the movie, he's very dissatisfied with what he's painted and he paints over it and destroys it because it didn't work out. It um, is and very that fascinating. creation, yeah, that, that's very suspenseful and very much in keeping with, with what Clouseau did in, in fiction film. It's very fascinating to see how He's known for suspense and, and thriller films, and how that sense of suspense comes across the screen during this film is really impactful. I know that we'll talk a more about that a little bit later, but I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that it was Clouseau's dream to capture the, the process of the greats working like Mozart, but he was really, he was given this opportunity with Pablo Picasso and it seems really interesting that it would come about in, in this way. Can you tell me what sort of relationship did the two men have? Well, they were friends and they were neighbors um, and they hung around with a lot of the same creative people. Um, notably uh, Jean Cocteau, who featured Picasso in um, one of his films in a small cameo role, um, and many of the other artists who worked on this film and other films uh, by Clouseau were also known to Picasso. Um, the cinematographer on this film is Claude Renoir, um, and he was the nephew of the great filmmaker uh, Jean Renoir, 
who was the son of the great painter, Pierre Auguste Renoir. And there are a, a lot of artists who were, I, I won't say incestuous in the literal sense, but who hung out together and who were interested and intrigued by each other's ideas. And one of the great works of the filmmaker Jean Cocteau, uh, which was made, um, you know, I think in, in 1940, uh, was Beauty and the Beast, uh, the original version. And Beauty and the Beast had a score that has become legendary in motion picture history by a composer by the name of Georges Auric, who was able to use triumphant themes and scary themes in ways that seemed really magical and helped to enhance the magic of the, the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast that Jean Cocteau was putting on film. And he worked on Cocteau's other films too, such as Orpheus. And he was used by Henri-Georges Clouseau for this film because each work that's created in the movie has a, a small miniature musical score of its own. Um, it's not a leaden idea like Disney's Fantasia was, say, in 1941, in which you took a piece of great music and kind of cheapened it by having animation that was designed to, to make the music make sense as it were. I'll tell you one quick little story about Fantasia. One of the sequences in that film, um, which was Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, was used to illustrate um, the uh, world of dinosaurs millions of years ago. And Stravinsky, who was alive then in 1941, was invited to a preview screening of it. He was so angry at what he saw, at what he saw as the, the cheapening of the Rite of Spring, it was also cut down, that he stormed out of the screening room. And there was press waiting outside because Disney wanted to get some, some extra, extra miles out of this stunt. And the greatest press agent of all time was asked by the press, where's Mr. Stravinsky? He, he left through the back. Well, wh what was his reaction? And this guy said, Mr. Stravinsky was visibly moved which I always thought was one of the greatest, <laughs> greatest lines of all time, because he actually was. But Georges Auric did just the opposite. He took these great works of Picasso's and he enhanced them um, in ways that, that even Picasso approved of. Wow, and there is amazing music throughout this film as yeah. well. Uh, it sounds like we start off with some Spanish music before going to orchestra music. Can you tell me about the composer for this film? Um, this is this is Georges Auric, and and he was able to use just about any um, any type of film genre and turn it into something that grabbed your attention, but never at the expense of of the actual narrative. It only enhanced it. Um, oh, I and, see. So we hear him in Beauty and the Beast and Fantasia. Yes, absolutely. It's amazing. Not Fantasia. No, he stayed away from that one. Okay. But in, in Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast, yeah. Beauty and the Beast is one of my favorites. Yeah. And I I think you explained a little bit why Picasso agreed to do this film. The two men had a, a relationship to begin with. Had Picasso appeared in films in the past, or is this the first one? Yeah, he was in some documentaries that showed him at work. Um, and he had cameo roles in um, uh, at least you know one film, film of of Cocteau's, he was not averse to publicity from what I understand. Um, he was a celebrity already. And um, he was persuaded actually to come to the premiere of this film in Cannes. He said he wasn't going to go, he wasn't gonna go. And then he showed up on the red carpet in a, in a tux wearing his trademark bowler hat and looking cool. And it, it, uh, it excited the camera people and he became, uh, you know, a big celebrity that evening in the movie world. Uh, so uh, it was not that difficult to persuade him to do it, but it turned out to be a very um, a big commitment in a sense, because the picture took three months to shoot, eight hours a day of camera setups, hot uh -huh. lights, and painting, and drawing, um, and doing retakes of, of things. Um, and this was a really, really big commitment. And he went sort of a little bit bonkers at the end of, of all of it because uh, he, he wasn't quite used to having to um, live that way and certainly not to, to take a direction. 
So the fact that he and Clouseau were still speaking at the end of this experience, um, I consider to be a, a, you know, an amazing achievement for both of them. It sounds like it. And I'm sure uh, the audience was glad to see him arrive in his bowler hat and suit. I think he's pictured shirtless through most of this film. So it was Yeah, and one of the reasons really is just that it was so hot in there. Oh, uh, it, was, it was, you know, hot lights can do it to you in a, in, a, in a TV studio or a movie studio for a few seconds. I was an extra once in, a, in an actual movie and just being under those lights and in those conditions for a few minutes can can really dehydrate you. And to, to sit there and actually have to practice your craft in that kind of uh, environment, I think, uh, would probably be pretty tough to do. But it that, doesn't show. Yeah. That that explains it. it. I see that we have some new attendees that have just joined us in the audience. So just a reminder, we're talking with film curator uh, Elliot Wilhelm and curator of prints and drawings Claire Rogan, who we'll hear from in just a bit about the film The Mystery of Picasso. A link to that film has been posted in our chat box and is password protected. The link will be valid today and tomorrow only. Um, and Claire, getting back to our film, Picasso spent most of his life in France, where the film was created, but he's originally from Spain. What brought him to France? And can you tell me about Picasso's early life? Sure. Um, Picasso epitomizes this idea of genius that is so popular in the ways French art is told. And he was an artist who was a young boy, was so talented that his father, who was also an artist, trained him. He learned how to do uh, academic painting, what we would think of as realistic painting. By the age of 13, he was an amazing technician. And um, uh, sorry, I'm just going to cut this down, the noise down a little bit. So he goes to Barcelona to the School of Arts when he's 15. He goes to Madrid, and then by the time he's 20, he and a bunch of his Spanish friends have all moved to Paris because that is the world center of art. And they are living in Montmartre. They are dirt poor, but they are painting their hearts out. And there's wine, women, and song, but they really epitomize this myth of artistic creativity. So that's the beginning of Picasso. But what's interesting about him is that he has this incredible long life and he never stops changing. In a sense, this movie is about metamorphosis. It's about the creative process as a process of metamorphosis. But Picasso's life was a process of metamorphosis. He starts, he does the rose period. He does the blue period. He becomes a cubist. He defines cubism. He go, has a classical period after World War I. He becomes a surrealist. It goes on and on and on. And when we meet him in the movie, he's 70. He's got a villa in the south of France. But he he's really he is the genius painter in the French imaginary in 1955. And he has outpainted and outlived all of his rivals. So we're really seeing somebody at this moment where he's considered to be the genius above all. So it's a really fascinating idea, this idea that um, this movie is about the process of creation. And it's very much tied with how Picasso was seen in the press and in the popular vision at that point in time. Wow, I love the way that you draw those comparisons between his life and his various phases in, in this film, because it does seem like when we start off watching the film that the, the drawings are playful doodles and they seem to become more complicated as, as we go. Can you tell me more about Picasso's style? All right, <laughs> so as I said, it changes a lot. By the 50s, and let me wheel back a little bit. What we see in the movie, the first half are drawings that are done relatively rapidly with felt tip markers, which is a new technology. The felt tip marker is new in this period and with brush and liquid inks. And they choose those so that it can bleed through on the paper and the photography from is from the other side. That's the first half. And you see those unfolding. But 
about halfway through the movie, Picasso says, I want to go deeper. I want to use the oil paints like I do at home. And suddenly you have this shift to oil painting and also some of the drawings are in charcoal. And you see the difference from something that really is a doodle and rapid, but they're not the tools he usually uses. And they're not great drawings at the beginning. They're interesting, they're fascinating thought processes, but as drawings, they're not great drawings in the beginning. But I would argue when you start getting the oil paint on the paper, when you on, on the canvas, in fact, when you start getting the charcoal, you really see Picasso's incredible facility with drawing and with painting. And that's when you really see something that gets more, helps you understand why he's considered a great artist. But there's a shift um, when he changes media, you, you start to understand why he's so good when you actually get the nuances of the oil paint and the brush stroke and the mixing of colors and also the charcoal where he can, he can smooth it out and um, erase and go positive and negative. Is that why you would say, I noticed in the film, uh, the beach scene near the end comes to mind for me, his drawings start off seeming to be almost more realistic and become more abstract from, from there. Is that what you're describing? A little bit, but I would say also throughout his career, Picasso, some artists start with an idea and they map it out very carefully and they do preliminary drawings and everything is planned in advance. And Picasso is an artist who works the other way. He starts throwing things on the paper and moving them on the page and moving them around or on the canvas. And that's what you see in the second half. You see the paper collage coming on and then coming off. You see him deciding, is this the woman in the bikini? Is her hand standing up? Is her hand down? Is her head left? Is her head right? And you see him playing with all the different options. And that's really part of Picasso's process is this incredible series of changes. And it struck me, you know, if you, if for the viewers watching the movie, ask yourself, when would I stop? When would I stop and say this drawing is done? Because Picasso always goes on and then you think it's done and then he goes on again. So there's this incredible um, constant exploration that's very much part of how Picasso worked and part of why he's so important. It's amazing to see that process unveiled in front of your eyes as you watch this film. I'm wondering, do we see any self-portraits of Picasso in the film? Yes. Everybody except the nude woman, to some degree, is a self-portrait. OK, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> the matador is this allegorical portrait of the performer. The performer equals artist. So the matador who is dying on the, the horns of the bull, that is the artist who dies in the performance of his art, right? The bull is something is a character that Picasso used as a, an allegory of himself for many, many years, from the 30s onwards. In fact, there's a very famous uh, piece called the Minotaur, which is the, the Greek mythological character that's half bull and half man. And that piece is always understood to be this self-portrait of the artist as this primal destructive force that can't really contain himself. It's that the animal nature is part of the creative force. So the bull is, is a self-portrait in a way. There are several men in there. There's the artist, often nude. And again, this goes back to the idea of the classical art, of classical Greece. But anytime you see the palette and the paintbrush, that's the artist and that's absolutely a self-portrait. Hmm. And I, by, by self-portrait, I mean an allegorical reference. It doesn't necessarily have his features. Um, and then there's the short, fat, comic, leering man and I think in a way that's a comic joke about himself as an old man, because he, he was known to be short, right? But he wasn't a little dwarf by any means, but he does this sort of dwarfish leering old man. And I think that's a, a sort of comic joke at his own expense. So all of these are jokes or comments or self allegorical self-portraits in different ways. I, about an hour in, we see 
one of the bowls that you might be referencing. And Elliot, it at this point, Picasso pauses and he says, give me a large canvas. And the camera frame, it physically changes in front of our eyes. What is the director doing here? Well, the director's showing off a little bit. Uh, it, it's a very clever moment. Um, there was this screen process that was developed just uh, three or four years before. It premiered actually in 1953 around the world called Cinemascope. Uh, it was an old idea, but it was finally mass marketed in the early 1950s, and it was um, a response to television. The movie industry has always been paranoid, and they were always worried that people would find reasons to never go to movies again. And television was the ultimate one of those. They would stay home and just watch TV. So Hollywood decided that screens had to get wider. They had to get bigger so that people could see things they couldn't see at home. It made perfect sense uh, since uh, Clouseau was also a, a showman and loved technology in film, that he and Picasso would decide together, you know, all canvases are not the same size. When you go to a museum and you see paintings hanging, they're different um, sizes, uh, shapes, and aspect ratios, of course, wider, taller, um, all sorts of possibilities exist. They're, they're really infinite. So it's a playful moment, but it works wonderfully, especially when you see it in a, in a theater on the big screen, when Picasso says, I need more room. And what is the more room that he can provide him with but CinemaScope? People who were fans of CinemaScope at the time were a little bit puzzled because there's a big credit to CinemaScope at the very opening of the film, along with the opening credits. And yet the film is clearly not in CinemaScope. So people were scratching their heads. It's kind of like the opening of The Wizard of Oz being in black and white, even though it said the film is in Technicolor. But then suddenly this miracle happens. The screen widens and Picasso paints what he needs to paint in that in that wider space. Um, and it was also a kind of a gimmick that they were uh, hoping would would help to market the picture as well. Well, hopefully the effect will be just as strong watching on your computer screens at home because a link to the mystery of Picasso is in the chat box right now. It is password protected. So please follow that link, use the password Motown to watch the mystery of Picasso anytime today or tomorrow. Elliot, I'm wondering who established the direction of the editing, the choices and the order of the scenes? Well, that would be the director. Um, Henri-Georges Clouseau was a very strict filmmaker, just as Hitchcock was. The two of them were really, um, I won't even say two sides of the same coin. They were fighting for space on the same side of the coin. Um, and I think Clouseau's arrangement with Picasso was one that um, ultimately it was Clouseau who was going to have the final say as to what was going to happen, even to the point uh, where th there's a moment in the film in which you see the two men, you see Picasso uh, on the left and Clouseau here on the right. Um, and he, he gives Picasso a kind of a challenge. We are now used to video cameras that can shoot things forever. But in this era, there were film reels that had to be changed and they only ran about 10 minutes each. And I think we have that. Clouseau's a shot from yeah, that, on the exactly. that we can share on the screen from exactly what you're describing. Can we see that? Uh, please continue, Elliot. And Clouseau was um, trying to give Picasso something of a test, saying, look, there are only five minutes left in this reel. If you're going to paint something, it's going to have to be in five minutes. And sort of implies, I bet you can't do that, can you? And of course, he's like, sure I can. And he tells him later that he's got you know, 30 seconds left and he says, no problem. And what he does in that time frame is fascinating. I won't give away what it is, but he puts the, the viewer uh, and the canvas through a lot of changes in a very short period of time. And it's a stunt, but it's one that breaks the picture up a little bit, just enough so that we actually come back to the process and the fact that there are these people in this room doing this, creating this. And we see uh, at this point exactly how that's done. And it also brings us to the reality of filmmaking, that there, there are time limits on what you can show. And it's about what documentary is. 
Um, can you can you rehearse scenes over and over again, shoot them, and still call them documentary? Do you have to be unfailingly honest? Uh, there's a reason the French invented this term cinema verité, or the uh, cinema of truth, true cinema for documentary. The fact is that there is no such thing. Uh, every film, including this one, is edited and it's cut. But what they wanted to wanted to do with this film was to not do that editing within the creation of the works of art, except, as the director put it, chronologically. And well, so we speed up the action of creating these paintings, but we don't ever take you out of those paintings as they're being created. Space that is being filled remains the space that is being filled, whether it's a square image or a widescreen image. Um, and so if you're looking uh, to, to the answer, is it, is it a documentary in its heart? Is it telling you the truth in its heart? Is it spiritually honest? I would say yes. Elliot, that was such a great example. That scene is such a great example of suspense within the film, because I honestly thought that Picasso was racing against the clock and had five minutes to be finishing these paintings. How long did it take Picasso to create these works of art during the film? Well, they all varied. And they mentioned in one case that, that uh, there's a painting that took five hours that we see created in just five minutes or so on screen. Um, and so many of these things, you know, clearly if they were shooting for three months to create 20 works of art. You know that it was a long process. Uh, the process with the oils during the last portion of the film was somewhat different than the camera on the other side of the screen during the early portions of the film because the oils didn't act the same way in terms of how they transferred from one side of the canvas to the other when they were using the technique of having the camera behind it. So he would do a brush stroke, Picasso, and then he would move out of the way and then they would photograph the painting and then he would come back and do another brush stroke or two, what it was that he was doing. And then they would move him out of the way and then they would shoot the canvas straight on. Um, that's similar to the technique known as stop motion animation in which monsters and dinosaurs could be moved a frame at a time um, but here you're seeing a work of art created in a very compressed period of time with the artist physically removing himself from the camera's viewpoint. Um, so it's a different kind of, of speeding up than we see in the early portion of the film. But I think, again, in terms of honesty of chronology, it still shows you the thought process uh, and the, the you know, process of feeling. And is this right or is this not right? Am I going to change this? in the the order in which it actually occurred. Thank you, Elliot. And at one point in the film, we will see this, this beach scene that I'd like to talk about next, but we've been getting some feedback from our audience. I'd like to just reiterate that we're having a conversation with our curators, Elliot Wilhelm and Claire Rogan. There is a link to the film Mysteries of Picasso uh, in our Q&A box that you can find. The password is case sensitive. So when you type in that password, please use a capital M for Motown. Uh, that was a good observation. So thank you for writing that in. And I'll bet lots of people have started watching this instead of listening to us. <laughs> that's up to them. We'd love for you to stick around and listen to the rest of the conversation, um, but we really encourage you to watch the film, The Mystery of Picasso, uh, right after we wrap up our questions, which I have just a few more. Uh, one for Claire, because we're looking at one of the scenes that we see in the, the film on screen right now. This is after Picasso uh, de declares that he's going to get rid of this collage. You can almost sense his frustration, Claire. It's a suspenseful moment where you can uh, feel his frustration. Claire, what, what does this scene tell us about the creative process? Well, this particular shot that you have here comes at the end of what is really the tour de force finale. It's the work of art that takes the most time to unfold on screen. And he adds and he changes and he erases and he scrapes and he puts collage down and then he takes collage off and he 
you think, OK, there's a nude in the uh, actually a fashionable young woman in a black bikini. Remember, this is the French Riviera in the 50s. You know, bikinis are this new item of clothing. You start with this standing woman in the bikini with a hat. Then she gets a young man next to her. Then he goes away. All of these changes. And then just when you think it's done, he declares he doesn't like it and he wants a new canvas. And then the next thing we see is this. So he's worked out all these ideas and you've seen him play with all these choices. And then boom, you've got a complete new reworking. And about the only things that remain are details like the water skier. And if you look on that blue section in the middle, you'll see that there's a person water skiing in a little abstract boat. Or the idea of the awning, remembering again, this is the French Riviera. You sit out on, on, on the patio looking over the water. You've got your awning. But this is this moment of transformation where he's become completely dissatisfied and then he pulls it all together on a new canvas using many of the things he's worked through. This is a remarkable piece, one of my personal favorites in the film. A lot of the pieces that we'll see in this film, though, follow what I feel like is a very traditional like Picasso theme. Can you tell me about those, Claire? Sure. Um, I think particularly at the beginning, he is relying on this stock repertoire of images and topics that he has spent the last 40 years creating. Um, you see in drawing after drawing that is a nude woman in the artist's studio that gets repeated over and over again in different ways. And it's interesting, actually, because I realized um, the features of that nude woman actually reflect the features of his new love, which is Jacqueline Roque, who he ultimately marries and becomes his second wife in 1961. So the, the, the young woman with the long neck and the ponytail or the head draw back, that is Jacqueline. And this is still a relatively new romance. But this idea of the artist in the studio as this primal scene of artistic genius, it's very particular to French art. It's very particular to this idea of what is genius at this point. And it's a ge genius is male. And this whole movie just accepts the idea that genius is male, right? Um, and so you see that. But yeah, he has the matador. He has the, the woman in the studio. He has... The still life, which is another topic that he's done over and over again. Uh, later on, you get the circus performers, which go all the way back to about 1901. Uh, his, his fascination with performers, people on the edge, and you find the clowns coming back in. Um, so those are just some of the topics, but I do feel particularly at the beginning, he's, he's relying on almost on muscle memory, on ideas and compositions that he's known. Because we're not watching somebody with a still life in front of him, looking at the still life, studying it, going back and forwards. This is straight from the mind of the genius. This is flowing without interruption. And that's only possible because he spent the last 55 years doing this. Wow. And you alluded to Picasso's relationships uh, a little bit in the beginning. I've heard that he had somewhat of a bad reputation uh, around women. And I wanted to get your take on separating the behavior of the artist from the art itself. Well, I think this is something that I struggle with. And for me as a historian, as an art historian, what I want to understand is why something was made at that point in time and what it meant to the people who were looking at it then. And I'll come back to the question of his behavior with women. So remind me if I don't come back to that. But um, as I said, this is about genius as understood by the French in the 1950s. And genius is male, genius breaks the rules, and that includes all the bourgeois rules about behavior. The, all the bourgeois rules about how one should treat women, how one should treat one's children. That's OK. It doesn't matter. And in fact, it makes him more virile, more creative, more and more fulfilling this myth of male genius. So that's part of it. Um, Picasso had 
long, very troubled relationships with women. Many of his relationships were with women who were significantly younger than him. Um, and in fact, his daughter, his granddaughter, Marina Picasso, wrote a book about how his destructive behavior affected her entire family, how her uncle Pablo was an alcoholic who died of alcoholism, how her cousin, his, his grandson, Pablito, committed suicide. And so he was a destructive personality within his family, and that's very much part of it. But those details we didn't necessarily know at the time of the mismaking. Does that help a little bit? I think so. I think it's a, a question we all all grapple with in daily life. So it's really interesting for you to address that. I appreciate I appreciate it. Um, and if you have questions at home for our curators, please feel free to submit those in the chat box. We would love to hear from you. Um, moving back to Elliot, 20 original works were created during filming, as you mentioned earlier. What happened to those works of art and do any of them still exist? Yeah, a couple of them do, um, according to um, legend, at least. And uh, I guess they exist uh, in, the, in the hands of a private collector, but they were slated for destruction originally, and most of them were destroyed immediately after the shoot, as uh, Clouseau and Picasso agreed that these were works of art that were going to exist in this film. They were going to exist on screen, and then they would exist no more. Um, I'm called curator of film at the DIA, and yet, um, as we were talking about a little bit earlier before we went on the air, I don't have a collection of film at the DIA, um, except for some ephemera that we have, uh, but we're not a major film archive, like say the Museum of Modern Art or the Pacific Fr Film Archive Berkeley or the Cinémathèque Française. But instead, in our theater, and it will be open again someday, uh, we exhibit great works of art all year around, but they vanish, they disappear when the lights go up. They're shadows that are projected on the screen. And in a sense, I think in the mystery of Picasso, we see something similar. We see works that were created by someone who, who didn't work in the film medium, but who agreed to create these works to be part of what is a uniquely cinematic experience. And it's one of the reasons that I, uh, if, if, if and when the theater opens again, of course it will, uh, one of my dreams has always been, there are certain films, The Mystery of Picasso being one of them, that I would love to be able to exhibit every week at the same time, free of charge for the world to come in and discover. Um, like any work of art that hangs at the DIA, I feel like it should always be available for people to experience. And there's something so special about this experience that it was designed to be a living thing um, and to exist on a screen. And I think people who see it today or, or who watch it tomorrow are, are going to be able to take that uh, away from it as well. Elliot, I think you made such good points that these Films are only available when you come and see them in the DFT. Uh, we don't have our own personal archive within the museum. And I just want to say thank you for your efforts in bringing this film to us today, because I know that Elliot put a lot of hard work into making this film available to you uh, to watch at home for free. And we're really proud that we're able to offer it. So just a reminder, a link to the films in the chat box. You can, uh, just like if you were coming to the film theater, this film's going to disappear in the next two days. So please uh, watch it right after our conversation, which we need to start wrapping up now. But I wanted to mention, Claire and Elliot, we did get some audience feedback. We, uh, I didn't get any questions, but I got a lot of great job and thank you so much. Our audience is really appreciative of you both joining us today, as am I. So thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with us. Um, and Delighted. thank you. Yes, thank you. It was fun. And thank you to those uh, watching at home. I really hope that you enjoy the film and can join us again next week for our regularly scheduled program, uh, which will be August 6th at 1 p.m. for Ordinary People by Extraordinary Artists, a discussion focused on Degas, Renard, and Friends. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.
جوان